And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we're here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. He was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and have no fear. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, Tell no one the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. Good morning. It's great to see you this morning. Hope that you're enjoying the cooler weather that we're having. It is a taste of fall and what what is to come. Throughout the Bible, God teaches us things in his word through what we might call the paradox of really opposites. He tells us that life comes through death. He says that the first shall be last, and that it's better to give than to receive. Well, there's another paradox that we find, and that is the idea that glory comes through suffering. We find this in the account of the transfiguration. There we see the majesty and the glory of Jesus. But to comprehend that majesty, we have to understand know that glory had to come through that darkness. So if you have your Bibles, I'd encourage you to Matthew chapter 17 as we look at this account of the transfiguration. And just to give you a little bit of context as you're turning there, one week prior to this is when Peter had made his confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then that Jesus begins, or he continues to tell them and foretell his death to, his, to the disciples. And he's saying, I am going to go to Jerusalem, I am, I am going to die, and I will be raised. If you look at his entire life from the beginning when he started his ministry, things begin to get darker and darker and darker. But in this one, we see an image of light. So I want us to sort of just look through this and walk through this this event. As we think about this event, we see that Jesus is transfigured. He takes Peter, James, and John, and he goes up onto a mountain. And while he is praying there, he is changed. The Greek word there is metamorpho, which means to transform, to change form or figure. We see that his face became different. Matthew says that it was shining like the sun. His clothes changed. They became white and gleaming like flashes of lightning. Mark's account says that no longer on earth could whiten them as they were. We see his glory is being revealed. Now, if you go back to the Old Testament, we see that God revealed himself to the children of Israel most of the time in the idea of the glory cloud. It was there as they come out of Egypt, protecting them from the Egyptians. And it was there at Mount Sinai. God descended on Mount Sinai. And we see that there on that mountain, there's the voice of God that is heard. Moses is there. And he goes up into the cloud. 
There's thunder. There's lightning. The mountain itself shakes. God tells the people, if you this mountain, you will die. Now, that's, that's the picture that we have back in the Old Testament. If we fast forward now to Matthew chapter 17, let's do just a, a little bit of a comparison and say, okay, well, what's different there? In Matthew 17, they're on a mountain. The voice of God is heard. Moses is there. And Elijah is there, who also saw God's glory on the mountain. The glory cloud is there. But what's different? Now, the glory emanates from a person. The light from his face, the clothes that he was wearing, was not reflected light. Like Moses, when Moses came down from the mountain, Moses' face was glowing, but it wasn't because of something inside Moses. It was that he had been with God. He was reflecting the glory of God. But now, the light is coming from Jesus. The glory came out of him because he is the source of glory. Herschel Hobbes says it this way. This was not a light shining upon Jesus without it was deity shining forth from within the wick of his essential deity which from his birth had been turned down low was suddenly turned up to burn in the brightness of his true glory what we see is that jesus is the glory of god in hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3 There the author says, and he, speaking of Jesus, is the radiance of his glory. The exact representation of his nature. And upholds all things by the word of his power. Jesus is the expression of the overwhelming beauty, of the majesty, of the glory of God. He is the glory cloud in human form. As one author put it, no other, way, no other way to see the glory of God more than what we see in the person of Jesus Christ. Not that He is someone pointing to God, but that He is the way in which you can see the heart of God. I am by no means a scholar at all, but I, I, I've looked and, and tried to understand a little bit about Greek philosophy. And in Greek philosophy, there is the idea of the logos, which really refers to a universal reason or rational principle that permeates the cosmos. That's in, in their understanding. That it is essentially, it is representing this underlying order and intelligence that is governing the universe. And it's often understood as a divine force that gives form and meaning to all things. And so the Greeks believe that that if you want to live what we would call ultimate reality, you want to have the best life, you need to make sure that your life aligns with the logos, this impersonal force this ultimate reality now keep in mind that idea of logos and then consider that john was one of the ones who witnessed this transfiguration think about how he internalized that and how he then wrote about it in his John says Jesus is the light. And he uses in, in, his, in the very beginning of, of his gospel, he says, and the word, he actually uses the Greek word there, logos. He says, and the word came flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. What John is recognizing is the Lagos isn't some 
principle or impersonal force, but it is a person. The ultimate reality is a person that you can know and love. Experience his delight because he loves you. And that you can be in a relationship of love with him. That's what ultimate reality is. That's the great life. That's, that's what we want to attain to. And he says, you can have that because it is a person. The transfiguration shows us that Jesus is not pointing to the glory of God, but that he is the glory of God. He is ultimate reality. If we go on at the conversation, as Jesus is changed. Moses and Elijah appear and are talking with him. I should just point out, Moses is now in the promised land. Remember, if you, go, if you go back to right before Moses died, he couldn't go into the promised land. He was prevented because of what he did. But now he's in the promised land because of Jesus Christ. And he's there with, with Elijah and they are there talking with him. Luke tells us that Peter, James, and John have been asleep. But now that they are fully awake and they see Jesus in his glory and they see Moses and Elijah in glory as well, but not the glory of Jesus. Moses and Elijah, are, we, we see in Luke chapter 9, they are talking to Jesus about his departure. Which... Luke, again, he uses the, the Greek word, he says, exodus. That exit that Jesus is going to go through, that his life is going to come to an end through the cross, through suffering. Jesus was nearing that point when things are just getting, they're going to be their darkest. He recognizes that men are going to reject him because he is going to Die for the sins of the world. But as we see him in the garden, he doesn't have the desire to go through it. He doesn't want to go through it. He will, but he doesn't want to. I think about Moses and Elijah. Moses was a leader of the children of Israel. He brought them out of Egypt by God's power. It was... Moses was the one who gave them God's law so that they could be God's people. And yet they rejected him. They rejected God. Elijah was a prophet and his whole, his whole life was spent to be turning the people back to God. And yet he faced rejection. All great leaders struggle to find courage to lead. Jesus as a man was no different. Think about it, in the past week, since they got to this point, a week ago, Peter, as he hears Jesus say, who do you say that I am? Peter then responds, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. But then Jesus begins to talk about, I'm going to go and I'm going to die. And Peter says, no, you're not. No, far be it for you, Lord. Don't, that's not going to happen. And Jesus actually has to say to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You're hindering what I need to go and do. I can only imagine what that would have been like for Jesus. It's like, you're just not getting it, Peter. You're there, but you're not. To understand what I have to accomplish. So imagine as a man, he's, he's struggling. And I think Moses and Elijah are there to offer encouragement and strength so that Jesus can accomplish, so that he can fill to the fullest what he came to do through the cross. But notice the reaction then that we see. As we see that Moses and Elijah are about to leave, Peter speaks. 
And Peter says, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us build three tents or three tabernacles. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And we're told by the gospel writers that Peter is speaking because he doesn't know how to answer. Luke says he didn't realize what he was saying. I think we all have to love Peter because he just blurts it out. Sometimes he doesn't even know what he's saying, but he just says stuff because that's what's on his mind. And he says, Lord, this is going to be great. We should, just, we should be here and we're going to build these tabernacles for you. Let's take a sidebar for a moment. Let's talk about the Shekinah, as it is in Hebrew, the, the glory cloud, the visible sign of God's presence. While it was with Israel, man could not approach the glory cloud or they would die. Moses is up on the mountain and with God, and he says, God, let me see you. And God says, you can't, or you're going to die. When Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 6, has the vision where he is in the temple, and he sees the, 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 if you will, the lower half of God's throne, he sees the robe of God. His reaction is, oh, woe is me, I am a man of unclean lips. Over and over again, the idea is that our being cannot handle God's being. There's a lot of things we can't handle. I mean, if I go out and I try and look at the sun for any extended period of time, my body cannot handle it. It will damage my eyes. I will go blind if I look at the sun that much. It, just, it, is, it is something that I cannot handle as my body is made. God is saying, I cannot handle my being. And so for God to dwell with his people, he says, I need you to build a tabernacle. And as we've seen before, while the tabernacle represented, especially on the inside, represented the idea of Eden and trying to go back into that, that perspective of reaching God and being with God, in the other aspect, what we see is it was this, we really would say it, it was acting as a shield for the people of God. Think about it. When Solomon built the temple, and they have it dedicated, the glory cloud descends on the temple. But the priests have to get out because it's so bright. The, the, the glory of God is so much that they can't handle it. They have to go out. So God is saying in one sense, that tabernacle is the shield that protects you from my glory. In one sense, I think Peter is saying, Lord, we need protection. Let us build three tabernacles so that we are protected from the glory. But before Peter can finish, a bright cloud overshadows them. The voice that they hear is of the Father, and he says, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. They hear the voice, and they fall on their faces, terrified. You and I wouldn't do anything different. Because of the glory of God. They recognize that. They are, they are terrified of what is, is, is about to happen. Why? Because there is a gap between God and man and its sin. 
We don't attain to His standard. We fall so short of being what God wants us to be. And that gap cannot be overcome by ourselves. But here's the amazing thing. Is that while this cloud overshadows them and and envelops them, Peter, James, and John do not die. They should. Because it's the glory cloud of God. But they don't. And the reason is Christ. You see, He's not just the God on the other side of the gap. He is the bridge over the gap. It is God coming down to us because we cannot do anything on our own. It is all what God is doing. Notice Peter, James, and John sacrifice at this moment. Jesus is the sacrifice. They didn't live the perfect life. It is Jesus who lived that perfect life. He is our sacrifice. So that by His exodus, by His going into suffering and death on the cross, we can go through our own exodus. That we can come into the glory cloud through Jesus Christ. And here then is the paradox of glory through suffering. Because after Peter, James, and John witnessed this, after it has all happened, they're talking, and and Jesus tells them, He says, I don't want you to say anything about this until I have been raised from the dead. You see, Jesus is joining the transfiguration to the cross. That mountaintop on which they were on is now joined to the hill outside Calvary. You see, on the mountain, Jesus is revealed in glory. On a hill outside, He is revealed in shame. His clothes are gleaming their riches like light. His face shines like the sun. And yet outside Jerusalem, His face will be beaten. His clothes will be stripped and the soldiers cast lots for His clothing. Here, Moses and Elijah stand beside Him. Israel's heroes representing the law and the prophets. There He hangs between two Peter proclaims the wonder of Jesus. Lord, it's good for us to be here. And yet, there in Jerusalem, Peter says, I don't know you. Not once, not twice, but three times. And all of the disciples are hiding in shame. Here the white cloud overshadows things. It is the glory cloud, and yet there the, the darkness comes over the land. Here on the mountain, the Father speaks and says, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Listen to Him. And yet on the cross, Jesus will cry out, My God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? What Jesus is showing us is the glory that He has, it can only come through the suffering. He has to go through the darkness so that He can have that glory. And that in a very real way, Jesus in His suffering shields us from the glory of God. Because Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice. 
He is the ultimate priest. He is the temple. John would say there in John 1 and 14 that Jesus came and dwelt. He tabernacled is the, is the literal meaning of that word. Jesus says to, to the people, you are going to destroy this temple in three days. I will rebuild it. He's saying, I am that temple. And through his sacrifice, he reconciles us. He paid for our sins. So now that the very glory that should be fatal to us can now come into our lives. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, he says, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. What, could, what should have killed us now comes into our lives and molds us because of Jesus Christ. And the way in which it happened is that He lost His glory. He became small. He became darkness, if you will. That's what Philippians 2, verses 5-11 through is all about. How Jesus came down to us. He gave up His glory so that we could receive it. He prays to the Father in John 17, the glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one just as we are one. What does that mean for us then? As we look at this, this, this amazing picture that is descript, described for us in the Gospels, what does that mean for us? If Jesus is true glory, if He is ultimate reality, that which we want to attain to, then obey Him. It's interesting, I was, I was doing some reading and, and someone pointed this out. These two Greek words, the Greek word for listen is akouo. The Greek word for obey is hoop. Akuo, which means intently listen. And so when, when God the Father comes and He says, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased, listen to Him. Listen really has that idea of not just listen with your ears, but listen with your entire body. If He is true, if He is ultimate reality, then what we are saying, He can't just be something in my life. I can't have a side of Jesus with everything else in my life. He has to be the reason I get up in the morning. He has to be everything revolves around. He's the one who is my everything because of what He has done. For me, it is an all or nothing proposition. But the other thing that I want us to see is that to experience His glory means that we experience the darkness. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 17, there Paul would write and say, And since we are His children, we are His heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share in His glory, we must also share His suffering. God does not paint a picture of following Him as a bed of roses. He doesn't say it's going to be all sunshine and rainbows. He says that there is going to come darkness into your life, but I am going to work through that darkness. And so when our life is filled with that darkness, no matter how things look, if we belong to God, His glory is at work in our lives. Paul says this. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning in verse so we do not lose heart. 
Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light, momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Our God says, I want you to share in my glory. That which on your own would kill you, I want to give that to you. But it comes through my son. And my son, who had that glory, gave it up. He went into the darkness so that you could have his glory. But it won't be all joyful times. There's going to be difficulties, there's going to be problems as we walk this road to what we can expect. And Paul says, you know what? It is momentary light affliction. And all we have to do is go and read about the life of Paul. And he had it way worse than any of us here today. And he says, it's light stuff. Why? Not because he thought it was that, that hard or difficult, but what he says is, I'm looking to what's beyond. I'm looking to what I know I have as my inheritance. And he says, it far pales in comparison to anything that is here on this earth. This life is momentary. Maybe we're given 70 years. Maybe we're given 80. But then what next? There's something far grander, far greater of what our Lord has prepared for us. And he's offering that to you and to me. To say, don't look at just, don't get your head right down in all of the problems and the mess that you're going through right now. Look up. And see what you have in front of you. See the glory that awaits you. See the glory that is in your life right now to change you so that you and I might be transformed just like our Savior was transformed. That's his call to you and to me this morning. Would you heed it? If not, what's holding you back? What's keeping you from living for Him to, to truly say, you are my Savior, you are my Lord, Jesus, and to give your life to Him? Because what He says is, because I died for you, I want you to give your allegiance to me and to go in through baptism, through the grave of, of the watery grave and to come out and it's not what we do Jesus does it is all his grace that makes us clean and makes us whole are you living that way today are you in need of prayers if you need anything in any way won't you come as together we stay